delighted to introduce fellow CCT board member, Dr. Richard Conrath, author of the trilogy collectively known as the Cooper Mysteries. Richard will give his thoughts on being a writer and on his latest work, Cold Copper Moon, which is just being published. Richard has had quite a life, having been a grave digger, a, um, a, uh, having changed uh, tires for Firestone, having built barrels as a cooper. In the meantime, he was in the seminary studying for the Catholic priesthood, later working for three years as a priest in a small diocese in Southern Ohio. After three years, Richard left to teach philosophy at a college in Ohio. During that time, he freelanced for the Cleveland Plain Dealer as he worked on his PhD at Kent State University. He was on campus when four students were shot on May 4th, 1970, an event that inspired him to write his doctoral dissertation on campus riots. Richard left his philosophy job and moved with his wife and children to begin a series of three-year stints in administration as a college vice president, a college president, and then headmaster of an American school in Turkey. He says that it was in Turkey during the darkness of the winters there that he began to write his first mystery, Cooper's Moon. Blood Moon Rising was his second book, and the new Cold Copper Moon is just finished and published. The second book in the series, Blood Moon Rising, was a finalist in the 13th annual Killer Nashville Silver Falchion Reader's Choice Award. As a finalist, Richard was in the company of other well-known authors, including Nelson DeMille. The Killer Nashville Magazine describes that award as recognizing, quote, engaging stories that have three elements, mystery, uh, mysteries, thrillers, and suspense. Uh, having just finished Copper, Cold Copper Moon, I can assure you that Richard's books have all of those elements and more. Now Richard is writing a new series inspired by his time as the headmaster of a prep school in a rural village in Turkey. This new series, The Blood Merchants, will take the reader into the underbelly of the country's myriad of bad guys with a whole new group of fascinating characters. Richard, welcome. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bill. And I, I suppose I, I can't say any more about Bill than he is a, um, an accomplished moderator and introducer. Uh, what a marvelous introduction. I learned some things about myself. It's just that <laughs> sometimes we forget those things. And by the way, we have an unusual event taking place today. As you know, William's last name is Pope. And so I think for the first time in history, we have a Pope introducing a former priest. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. And thanks to the CCT family for hosting this uh, webinar, uh, to our president, Tammy, to of course, Sifpora, our ever important person who's uh, helping to, to run this thing. Without, without Sifpora, we wouldn't be getting very far today. And I wanna thanks, uh, I wanna give thanks to all of you. Yes, I, Karen just sent me a note about Amy, our president, yes. Amy Turner. Um, and thanks to all of you who are here, uh, friends, uh, neighbors, uh, people who have read my book, those that haven't. Uh, I would like to give you a special thanks because without you, I would not have the motivation to write at all. And thanks finally to my wife, whom you may not see now, but she's sitting here with me, uh, without whom I would have no marketing uh, no one to bounce my ideas against, uh, no one to really render, uh, um, you know, what I could say as a, as a meaningful evaluation of my book. In other words, this book really is horrible. You need to rewrite it. <laughs> if someone is going to do that, it's going to be Karen. Uh, so thanks to her. She's also a writer herself, as you probably know. Uh, she is both a journalist and a writer. Uh, we both uh, we both wrote for the Cleveland Plain Dealer um, and for the Sunday Magazine. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to briefly tell you about what I'm going to do. 
uh, in any great speech, you tell them what you're going to tell them, and then you tell them, and then you tell them that you told them. So I'm going to be talking about uh, how my life as an author began from earliest times, uh, and then begin talking about the actual books that I began writing, and I'll do some readings from that, as well as tell you about where we are today. And we're also going to announce some uh, some prizes, some giveaways, uh, so that my wife will take care of that. So let's begin with, with where we are. So I have a slideshow here that will, um, that will help you follow me. Let me call it an author's journey from poetry to mystery. You know, my writing uh, folks all began with poetry and it ended in mystery. Where did it begin? Well, right here. You can see behind me a little, a little hearth burning. Uh, this is a fake fire. Uh, we're not in Alaska, but it sure looks good, doesn't it? There it is burning away. Well, our family in the 1950s, 19, late 1940s and 50s, would gather around the fireplace on Friday or Saturday nights. And, uh, and the challenge that my father gave us was that we had, to, we had to read a line from a poem and the challenge of the others, the rest of the, set of the seven kids, seven of us all together and mom and dad, uh, our challenge was to identify what poem that was and what poet. So somebody would read, say, a line from Edgar Allan Poe. Um, Once upon a midnight dreary, as the raven begins, as I pondered weak and weary. And somebody would raise their hand, they'd say, who, Dad would say, who's that? Or Mom would. Um, and we'd identify the poet. Dad was a, a rather famous poet. He was the poet laureate of Southern Ohio. My mother and dad also were published poets, and dad also published a, a short story in uh, This Week magazine. He won a contest. And he was also, I have to tell you, a cooper. He was a working man. Maybe he had an influence on the main character in my books. My mother was a graduate of a university, Western Reserve University in Cleveland. And so, you know, my life carried me uh, from there into the seminary at age 12. 13, this isn't all about that, and uh, into the priesthood and beyond. I, the only writing I did there was more academic stuff. I remember writing two poems sitting in front of a fireplace in the seminary in a little town in southern Ohio outside of Steubenville. Um, and uh, those two poems did get published early on. And um, the publisher was me, myself, and I. I was the founder and publisher of the school newspaper. And so I had published both poems there and I was very excited about my first publication. And I congratulated and thanked the publisher. In the meantime, I made my way through the seminary through 12 years, went into the priesthood and then left the priesthood and uh, then taught philosophy for 16 years. And during that time, most of my writing was all academic. Uh, during that time, I also freelanced for the Cleveland Plain Dealer and with my wife, we wrote stories for the Plain Dealer of uh, True Stories, documentaries for the Plain Dealer Sunday Magazine, a magazine which is still being published today. And then I had a drought kind of in writing. I moved into administration. I became a community college vice president in Michigan and then a, a community college president in Maine and then again in, in Cape Fear, North Carolina where I always thought the movie Cape Fear was made, but it was not, um, but it was named after the Cape Fear movie. Uh, <clears throat> then after that period of time, uh, my wife said, it's about time I, I thought I'd leave the community college work and administration. And uh, she said, it's my time. So we decided to move overseas, her choice. And, um, and we wound up in Turkey. And the nights there were dark, and cold, even in the summer. And so my wife and my youngest son, Ryan, who was then eight or nine years old, said, Dad, why don't you, uh, my wife didn't call me dad. <laughs> she didn't say husband either. <laughs> anyway, in front of our son, she said dad. 
uh, why don't you write some stuff and then read it to us at night? And so I did. And thus began Cooper's Moon. But at that point, Cooper's Moon was a horror story. It was about a young kid who loved to sleep at night in a coffin. He was a 13 year old. And both uh, my wife and my son Ryan said, that's a terrible book. And so by the time we left Turkey, which was in the, I guess, 1996, came back to this country, moved to Florida, um, I began rewriting Cooper's Moon as a mystery. And how did I begin to write? Well, a question that people ask, and um, maybe I'll wait till the end to answer this, is how do you do it? Do you outline first? Or do you write by the seat of your pants? We call the by the seat of your pants writer a pantser, P-A-N-T-S-E-R. An outliner, somebody who outlines in great detail, you know, right where the book's going, James Patterson does that. Robert Frost is a pantser. He begins writing, and when he's done, he knows it's over. And I began as an, uh, for instance, with Cooper's Woman, I began as a pantser. I began at the beach house in Sanibel while I was trying to make some money to keep body and soul together by doing consulting. I got an agent. Then I spent long nights writing and listening to my idol, Leonard Cohen, author of such fine music, musical, musical uh, songs, I should say. Um, hallelujah. So that's where it all started. And by 2009, I had completed my first book in the Cooper Mystery Series, Cooper's Moon. This uh, cover is designed by one of the top designers in New York, um, <clears throat> happens to be my daughter. <laughs> and, uh, but she, the New York Times said she's one of the five best designers in the city. Uh, and this book is a um, beginning of the Cooper Mystery Series, the first of three. How did I write it? I think I already said that over a 10 year period, listening to Leonard. I didn't listen to Leonard Cohen for 10 years. No, unfortunately he, he died here just recently. But with my wife as my principal reader, editor, critic, muse, chief cook and bottle washer, everything like that. And my agent as someone who would read it and then send it back and say, he didn't love the ending. I had to change the ending kill all the bad guys. He said, you have to kill the bad guys. You can't leave them around for another book and then add 20,000 words. So that added, added another year to my writing experience. So you see, writing is a long process and writing a novel is a long process. People say, is this a hobby? And I say, oh, <laughs> a hobby that takes that much work? No, I don't think, I don't think so. And so I, I mentioned getting an agent Tristram Coburn, um, had, uh, Tristram Coburn's literary agency, and he shot my books for about five years or so. And I began to write book two. And book two uh, was entitled Blood Moon Rising. So I developed something called the Moon series, Blood, uh, Cooper's Moon, Blood Moon Rising, and the third book, A Cold Copper Moon. I remember uh, trying to figure out a title for my first book, Cooper's Moon, because sometimes you come up with a title at the end of it, you know, when you're all done. Um, I came up with Blood Moon Rising at the end. Cooper's Moon, I initially named Hunter's Moon. Then one day I was in San on Sanibel Island at Doc Ford's. I ran into Randy Wayne White, whom I got to know. <clears throat> if you don't know who he is, he's a, a very famous Florida writer and now a nationally recognized writer, and he writes mysteries about Southern Florida. He even included Tampa in one of his most recent books. I said, Randy, he's, I've finished my first book. Would you please read it? And of course, why would he read my book? Oh, heavens. And he said, well, what's the name of it? <clears throat> I almost said Hunter's Moon. As I stood there looking at him, and he was waiting for more uh, for an answer. I thought, oh my gosh, that's the name of his, I believe it was his seventh book. So 
why would I name it that? And so suddenly I changed it to Cooper's Moon and thus the title for that book. How ironic. And he said, I like that title. It has catch to it. And I always wondered what he would have said if I had said Hunter's Moon. I like that title? Probably not. <clears throat> and so I'm going to read first from the second book in the series, Blood Moon Rising. And this is the prologue to that particular book. It has been raining for five straight days now, and the river is swollen, threatening to spill over the banks and inundate this small Ohio city. It's late autumn, and this is what happens every fall on the river. Rain, rising tides, flooded homes, and people stranded on rooftops watching cars and animals floating down the river. People ask, why don't they just move? The answer is because this is their home. It's late, 3 a.m., and the waters of the Ohio are racing toward the Mississippi. The blood moon riding low in the sky now, watching the whole scene like a curious silver eye, casting its light on the waters and illuminating the flotsam that is beginning to jam the river and force it onto the shore. The people who were standing on the banks earlier in the evening have gone to sleep, hoping for a better day tomorrow, which means, of course, that the rain will stop. What they aren't seeing now is a body, or should I say, parts of a body, washed against a pile of tree branches, bouncing like a rubber doll, one arm flopping as the water, as the waves from the torrents strike it, the other arm missing, skin peeled back on the trunk. Her face, or what's left of it, is swollen and grotesque. The soft light of the moon, unable to alter the fact that her body is decaying. The night breeze, unable to hide the stench of rotting flesh. Her clothes are torn from the punishing waters and her eyes, only holes now, stare into the night sky as if anxious to release the secret of what had happened. That's Blood Moon Rising. That's the beginning of the story. And each one of the books that deals with the story began in book one when Cooper was teaching a philosophy teacher, teaching at a, a local college in Southern Ohio called New Concord College um, in the town of Muskingum. And by the way, those of you from Ohio will know that there is no Concord College and there is no town named Muskingum. They've changed the names to protect the innocent. <laughs> so the town's actual name is New Concord and the name of the college is Muskingum. And they're still there. So don't tell them I told you, it's a secret. And while Cooper is, is teaching at the college, one morning in autumn, in late autumn, a dean knocks on his door and says, Cooper, your son. And Cooper says, what? Uh, your wife, he says, what? I thought maybe she, she was sick. No, she's missing. And your wife, and when, when Cooper hears that, the first thing he thinks of is getting home and finding out what happened. My seven-year-old son. And he looks back at his class, and the dean says, never mind, I'll take the class. You go home. And he goes home. And that's the beginning of his eight-year journey through three books to find out what happened to his seven-year-old son who was either kidnapped or killed. And you won't know until you read The Gold Cup, Copper Moon. And I'm not going to tell you. So you're going to have to read it. And there's someone who did uh, buy both books at Barnes & Noble. Yes, they're, they're available there. Uh, Cold Copper Moon uh, will be available. You can order from them or any other bookstore. Uh, that's Louise Foreman. She has our permission to show her picture. Could be you someday. You'll be holding two books and, and we'll show your picture to an audience. And so, I have to move this over just for a minute.
I had an ending in Blood Moon Rising, but I didn't have one for a cold for a Cooper's Moon. Um, I knew what I wanted to start to say, but I didn't know how to get there. And finally, in, in deciding what to do in both Blood Moon Rising and a cold copper moon, I decided that I would let the characters take me where they want to go. Um, Cooper's always looking for his son, Maxie, while he makes, a, makes a, a, a living with kind of side cases in each book. And the first book, it's all about, it's all about uh, kidnapping. And oddly enough, uh, I can't reveal that to you either. Uh, you'd be surprised to hear who the kidnappers are. And this is not me, by the way. Uh, and Cooper, through all three books, is always looking for a son as he tries to solve these cases. So the side stories, the bad guys are selling body parts, medical experiments are going wrong. There's drugs, there's gangs, there's the Chinese Tong. There's a little bit for everybody. And so the main character is Cooper. What's he like? Is he a loner? Uh, no, he's not. But in another sense, he is. He has good friends. And in each one of his books, he has enemies. So though he's a, a loner, he has folks around him who help him. Uh, and where do the characters come from? Well, some of them come from you. And so uh, you could be in this line somewhere. I don't know, maybe the person at the very beginning of the line, the dark in the dark clothes, that could be you. Um, we pick our characters, but not, not completely from folks that are in line. And how do we do that? Well, you know, uh, they, they appear creatively. I don't know where they come from. They just sort of pop up in your conscience. I always like to think of the characters coming to me uh, in my sleep. Uh, one author makes the analogy of, uh, she tells a story of how there's a big line of characters outside her bedroom. She's asleep at night. She hears a commotion in the street, gets up, and there's this long line of characters out there who are waiting to get into their, to her book. And that's kind of what it's like, people wanting to get into your book somehow. Although I did offer someone the chance to get into my book and use him really, and then he, he decided not to. <laughs> he wasn't sure what would happen to him because he, he was, you know, he thought maybe it, it didn't paint him in the best possible light. I thought it painted him in a very good light, really. So where do they come from? They come from real life. Someone asked uh, a famous writer one time, uh, a writer from Detroit, where do you get your dialogue? Because he's a great dialogue. And he's how to get it from you. I listen to you in the post office. I listen to how you talk, you know, in, in the grocery store. I listen to you in the park. And that's where, you, that's where we do get our dialogue. I remember listening to a long dialogue uh, one time in a, in a post office, and I used that dialogue. I didn't ask them. I didn't use their name. I remember being in a restaurant one time, and we were sitting there. It was a restaurant in Boca, and uh, my wife and I were both there. And um, the place was pretty well empty. And suddenly, someone settled alone. We were in the second booth from the front. Uh, someone settled in the booth in front of us. And the waitress came over and he said, is the boss here, is Bob here or something like that? She said, he's busy, he's in the kitchen. And he said, well, tell him, tell him I, said, I asked him to come out here. Give him my name and he gave her his name. And the, the owner sort of appeared, they had an apron on and he came over and sort of looked kind of puzzled. And the guy said, sit down. So let's say, let's call him Bob. Bob sat down. The man proceeded to tell him about the fact that his son had come in several times to collect some money that he owed him. And he said, oh, geez, I, I didn't see him. I missed him. He's called you too. I didn't get those phone calls. He said, that's strange. He said, He's called pretty regularly. I think you should listen to him. Take those calls. He said, oh, I will. And he said, you know, you really have a lovely wife. And I began to get uneasy. 
and my wife did. I looked at her. He said, you have a couple of really successful kids, don't you, in school? And I said, yeah, 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 I, I do. That's wonderful, he said. And then he said, and so you're going to answer the phone when my son calls the next time. And the fellow said, oh, yeah, oh, absolutely, I'll answer the phone. Don't worry, I'll take care of this. I said, good. And he said, did you want something to eat? No. I said, fine, thank you very much. And he got up and left. And what we had just witnessed there was a great scene in the book. It's a threatening scene, isn't it? A man delicately asks, how's your wife? She's a lovely person. And your children, how are they? And so we have protagonists, don't we? Here's one of them. Here's Cooper. Does he look like <laughs> Clint Eastwood? Perhaps so. Then here's Jilly, Cooper's wife. You know, she's an English professor. Cooper is a philosophy teacher at this Concord College made up place. You know, it's fun to make places up, by the way, folks. If you write books for no other reason than to make things up, it's so much fun. You can create your own towns, create your own characters. You can kill them. I'm sorry, I don't. Like, well, you can. You have, the, you have the power over life and death as a writer. So Jilly is his, his wife, and Cooper and she struggled over the disappearance of their son for a year, fought you know, over that issue. Like, if you'd been home more, you would have. And Cooper said, I'm teaching in the college next door, just like you are. Yeah, but I'm home more than you are if you'd been here. And he said, and he would say, well, if you would have watched him more closely, where were you when he was out in the yard playing? And they would fight like that for a year. And finally, they just broke it off. And Cooper, they didn't fall out of love. You know, when people lose kids, when they, they don't fall out of love, folks. They, you know, the, the loss of a child is just, is, is a terrible thing. And so they remain in love remain separated and Cooper goes to Miami and then he becomes a cop he got a clue down there that perhaps his son was there and a cop friend of him told him that told a cop friend of his told him that and Cooper then joins Miami Police Department as a street patrolman philosophy professor to street patrolman Pope like William Pope from Pope to an international um, what were they? Uh, it's a ambassador and, and acting ambassador, uh, an official overseas. It's amazing what we can do. Uh, and so, uh, and so this was kind of like what the college looked like. Uh, life in Southern Ohio, a small college town, is very slow. And yet, someplace along the street here, where that house is, there. Um, Somebody came and stole his child. And this is <laughs> our idea of who Maxie is. Pretty, pretty good looking kid, right? Anyway, he was seven years old when he disappeared. And here's Richie. He's, uh, he's one of, Rich, he's one of, of Cooper's friends uh, in Cleveland. Richie and Cooper grew up together in the streets of East Cleveland. Uh, in the rough streets, uh, Richie used a ball bat to, uh, to enforce what he did. Cooper had a gun, even at that young age, right? And uh, another friend of his, Anthony DeFelice, he probably looks strikingly like a, like a Hollywood actor. But that's the way I picture him, a, a Miami homicide cop. Um, he also grew up with, with Cooper, you know? It's who you know, right, in the streets of Cleveland. And they fought their way home. And actually, my youth was that way. I lived near a factory, and I had to fight my way home every day. Um, and so DeFelice and Richie and Cooper learned the harsh ways of life there on the streets of Cleveland. And some of Blood Moon Rising takes place in Cleveland, Ohio. Some of it takes also takes place in central Ohio. By the way, DeFelice, this tough Miami homicide cop, neither he nor Richie are married, 
uh, Richie is a, a, a mafia hitman. Um, and uh, Tony DeFelice was married. He's single now and he's helping to take care of his wife's father, his wife who left her father, um, comes to Richie DeFelice for help. And so DeFelice, this tough guy, takes care of him. And here's Louise Delgado. She's another character in Cooper's story. She's a homicide cop and she's assigned to gangland. Uh, and so therefore we deal with gangs in all three books, uh, specifically in book two, the Miami gangs and in book three, the, uh, the Boston gangs uh, who also come to Florida. Those are the Chinese gangs. So it's a hard kind of place where Cooper is, uh, where he looks for his son. Then we have Huckster Crow, because Cooper lives on the edge of the Everglades by himself. He's, of course, not married. And he is dating, kind of dating, uh, Louise Delgado. But here is Huckster Crow, Everglades cowboy and alligator hunter. And he's one of the original Seminole Indians whose parents and grandparents were involved, in, well, grandparents, involved in the Seminole Wars, if you've heard of those in, in, uh, in Southern Florida or in Florida, period. And here's Herman, another very important figure in the three books. Herman is Cooper's pet alligator, if you've ever heard of such a thing as a pet alligator. And guess who Herman's best friend is? Well, it's Sammy the cat. Uh, he's, <laughs> he's Herman's overseer. You know, he plays with him at a safe distance, but he ignores him and Herm Herman pretty well ignores him too. Herm Herman is older now. He's kind of retired, uh, retired alligator. Lives in Cooper's backyard. Cooper threatens people who are not nice people with this aging, uh, uninterested alligator. But if you probed him too much, he might take an interest in doing something about it. Florida Everglades is the main character, you know, hundreds of thousands of acres, the largest, I believe the largest green place uh, development in the world, that's uh, wetlands, and it stretches for about 60 miles from east, west, maybe more, and maybe the, the same uh, uh, north and south. It's a forbidding place, and um, you know, it's there's a lot here. and see what's hiding. If you could find them, you would find it's teeming with wildlife and dangerous. And some of the most dangerous creatures in the Everglades are the wild dogs. Uh, believe it or not, there are lots of alligators and crocodiles there. And there are probably close to 70,000 pythons, but you never see one. They very cleverly hide from you someplace under those dark skies right now, illuminated by the the, uh, that's probably sunrise. And then there's Miami. And Miami is a character also in the Cooper Mystery Series. I describe it as a dark place with beautiful skylight at night that just uh, is, is like a Walt Disney movie picture and dark in its underbelly. But under that bright lights, under those bright lights at night, there's a very dangerous side to it. And I do get criticized by my Miami friends who say I characterize Miami um, too darkly. It's really not that bad. And I agree. There are lots of places in Miami that are beautiful and that are not dangerous. But Miami continues to be a, a dangerous city. And not to know that is to fall prey to its darkness. And finally, the third book of the series, the mystery of Maxie's disappearance is finally solved oh, for good or evil, but I can't tell you, right? Not until you read it, because I'd have to kill you. But if you quote me, I'll deny that. Uh, the second book I'm gonna read from is book three, A Cold Copper Moon, which is the final book in the series, the Cooper Mystery Series. This is taken from chapter three. <clears throat> And Cooper now has taken on a new client. Her name is 
is Cynthia and her father, a fishing boat captain, has gone, mis has gone missing on his boat out in the Everglades somewhere. And she asked Cooper if he could try to find him. And so Cooper is following her to the Keys to her father's marina, uh, where they're going to get on a ship, a boat, I should say, not a ship, and, and look for her father in the 10,000 islands. And so her Jeep is just ahead of him as they hit the bridge that crosses Florida Bay. And Cooper begins to fall into one of his dreams again, as he often does about his son, Maxie. And he says, I'm the guy that's supposed to be so lucky in finding missing persons. The guy who hasn't even found his own son. Wow, one lucky guy. And my mind drifted into memories of dreams. I have them nightly now, he thinks. Nightmares are what they really are. The screen door slammed after him as he ran across our porch, down the wooden steps to the front of our house, an old colonial, and into the yard, freshly green from the recent rains. He threw a baseball into the air and caught it. He always did that. And then he ran in circles as he tossed the ball, scuffed from falling into the dirt, watching it into his mitt, laughing each time he threw it into the sky, a little higher each time. And he would do this until I would come home, Jilly would tell me. And then we would play catch, but he would have to practice in the meantime. I was watching him now as the ball sailed higher and higher, floating into a cloud and then dropping out of the white, Maxie losing it momentarily, then reaching for it when it appeared once again and missing it. It hit the ground and rolled toward the road slowly at first, and I held my breath. But as he chased it, the ball caught the edge of an incline and continued its descent more rapidly. Maxie after it quickly, laughing at the ball as though it were something living, playing hide and seek, his hair blowing in the wind like the wheat in the nearby field, the mid-morning sun bright on his face. And he took the incline quickly. I tried to stop him and hurtled down after the ball until it came to a rest in a ditch bordering the road, settling in some mud and stones at the very bottom of the incline where he reached for it, rubbing the ball against his pants to wipe it clean of the grime from the ditch. But a man stooped down and said, let me help you with that. And I tried to warn him. And Maxig looked up at him, a stranger with an odd voice, not at all like the voice of Anthony who owns the antique shop on Main Street, nor like mine, nor like anyone he'd ever heard. The man took the ball from him and said, let's go to my car and get a rag and clean this ball up for you, eh? And he took the boy's hand before he could answer and led him to a black car, opened the door and said, now let's see if we can find that rag, shall we? Then he asked Maxie to look in the back seat, to see if he could find it, because his eyesight wasn't that good anymore. And Maxie did, felt a shove, and fell forward into the seat, the car door slamming at the same time as his mother called out, Maxie, Maxie, where are you? And I tried to call out too, but the car was already moving quickly ahead, too late for him to see the door of our house opening as he looked out the back window of the car. But I could see him. I could see the fear rising in his eyes and choking him. I could see him look into the front seat where a second man was rising up and reaching for him while Maxie was trying to call out for me. And I reached for him again, called him. But fear must have closed his ears. And I watched helplessly as they passed Anthony's antique shop. That kind of tells you the story of Maxie's kidnapping. You know, people, people might ask you, where do you get those ideas from? Well, you know, that particular scene of this kid disappearing and his 
And Cooper seeing him in his nightmares, he doesn't know if this is real or not, he's having nightmares, right? Is kind of like the scene that I saw, and I bet some of you saw it. It happened in Sarasota, some maybe 15 or 20 years ago, I'd say, outside a car wash. You probably saw it, it was on national television. And a young girl was outside the car wash. She must have been 11, maybe, kind of just waiting for her parents who were inside, probably having coffee. It's okay, they figured it was a safe place. And then into this, into this scene, right? On the television cameras came this man, approached the young girl and reached out his hand and took her hand and she took his and he began leading her away, just like that. Young kids can be very trusting. And if you saw that, you knew, as I did, that we were being watched, a young child being taken away. And indeed, that is what happened. That man took her away. And she was found some, I believe it was six months later, Karen. A couple of days later. Was it a couple of days later? Found her in a grave. In a grave somewhere. Hastily grown, dug, dug grave. And there we had it. If you ever wondered whether kidnappings and trafficking of women and children occur, there's an example of it right there. And so my books deal with those issues as well as a search for for Maxi, it deals with trafficking, perhaps the most hidden major international crime ever with a country that's the major destination for trafficking, the United States, and the state in which we live for the most part, most of us are here or, or are from here, the major state where, where they come in to the US through the waters, of the Caribbean through the Everglades. Florida is the main state where most of that occurs, more than the Southwest. And so that's what I write about. You know, that scene, which is riveted in my mind, and I don't think I could ever get rid of it. And so those are the three books. I want to read you one last thing. Book number four is called The Blood Merchants. And that'll be out in a year, I suspect. And I wanna read you this passage. That's a quotation from another author. Because I find this uh, another part of the great untold story of what happens to young children and women. It doesn't matter what our moral position is on the subject. Bodies are unquestionably commodities. And yet they are uncomfortable ones. As a product, bodies aren't assembled new in factories filled with sterile suited workers. Rather, they are harvested like used, like, harvested like used cars and, and scrap mark markets. Before you can write a check and pick up human tissue, someone needs to transform it from a tiny piece of humanity into something with market value. Unlike scrap, the price of a human body isn't measured only in dollars. It is measured in blood and in the ineffable value of lives, both saved and lost. When we buy a body part, we take on the liabilities for where it came from, both ethically and in terms of the previous owner's biological and genetic history. It is a transaction that never really ends. This is excerpted from The Red Market by Scott Kearney, copyright 2011. And that's the quotation that introduces my fourth book called The Blood Merchants. It's not about vampires, although you may be surprised. I'm not gonna give that away though. Now the last reading I'd like to, to make for you is from the fourth novel, and not in the series, but a new series. Uh, in the beginning of this uh, series is uh, 
a book entitled Blood Merchants. And this is the prologue to that book. It was cold outside. It should be Providence in the winter, in the middle of the winter, actually, with ice hanging on the eaves like tinsel on a Christmas tree, waiting for the man in red pajamas to deliver presents to the kids who were sleeping, even though the houses didn't have chimneys. Crazy feast. He was thinking he wanted to be that man, you know, the one who climbs into people's homes. No danger of being arrested when everyone is in bed. Isn't that when the Clutter family out in Kansas was murdered one by one in the night while they were in bed by Perry Smith and Richard Hitch Hickok? You would think people would learn. And this is what he was thinking as he watched a man, a young man, coming out of the house across the street, his face lit up by the street lamp, laced in ice, and by a porch light that the girl had turned on. And she looked familiar. And they kissed in the moonlight, in the shadow of the trees that hung over the porch. But even in the shadows, he could see them clearly. And then they parted, she closing the door, but not before taking one more look back as he took the stairs to the ground, one at a time, probably slick from ice. And he finished, he found the gate at the white picket fence blocking his way to the street and opened it, looking back to see if she were still there. But the lights were out now in the house, but the porch light was not, and the street light was not. And he headed the short distance to his car, which was parked on the street, and directly across from the house, hard up against the curb, nestled snugly against the curb, well out of the way of cars that might drift off the straight path of the street and away from the protection of the streetlight that lost in the shadows of the late night. And he crossed the street in a relaxed way, the collar of his coat pulled up against his cheeks, his stocking hat pulled down over his ears, it was close to zero this winter night in Providence, Rhode Island. And he tried to open the door on the driver's side, but the key stuck in the lock and it wouldn't turn. And that's when he looked up and noticed the man standing in the shadows of a large oak and watching him, not 10 feet away. That's the beginning of the blood merchants. And that's the end of my story for the time being, but it goes on. But I'm gonna turn the floor over momentarily to my wife, Karen, who's gonna be telling you about some details here about a giveaway we have about prizes and tune your ears into what she has to say. Okay. Hi, I'm Karen Conrath. And thanks to everyone for coming to Richard's Meet the Author presentation. I'm uh, pretty much his PR person, marketer, editor. And um, since you're here today, perhaps you have an interest in reading uh, the wicked good books that he's written. As you know, this is the launch for A Cold Copper Moon. If you want to purchase the books, you can go on to Richard's website, which is richardconrath.com. Just remember his name. And all the instructions will be uh, written out for you. And then if you want to be a part of future contests and events that are happening in the area, um, sign on to his newsletter. And you will get all sorts of uh, information, probably weekly about way to enter contest. But today we have our own little giveaway contest. And what we're going to do is give away five, six, seven, eight, five books on Kindle. Not the Kindle itself, but five books on Kindle and your choice. And then we're going to give away a paperback of the new book and finally, the grand prize winner will get all three books in paperback, signed, personalized, sent to you. 
Um, the way we're going to do that is Sipora Brown has all of the emails of the many people that are here. And we're going to talk to her tomorrow and just throw out some random numbers and say number 48, and number 72. And wherever you are on that list, that's the person that's going to get the books. And we'll call you or email you and say, which book do you want? And then you will choose and that will be the next thing that you get. And other people can go on tonight or tomorrow or whenever. And Richard has priced the books very cheaply, 99 cents each for the Kindle. And uh, the, first two, the first two. And then the third one is 499. 499 for Kindle e for the mm -hmm. ebook. Excuse me. And um, so that is that is open to you for uh, purchase. And I Think, well, I don't think, I know that you must read the first one first, uh, Cooper's Moon. You read the third one and you've already got the answers and I just don't want you to spoil it for yourself. Um, so with that, um, I wanna thank you for listening and hope you enjoyed his engaging manner. Uh, his stories have shown me a side of him. I've been married 40 years and together 43. His stories show, has shown me a side of him that I don't like. It's, it's scary. What's, what's a nice guy like Richard Conrath doing writing these scary stories and coming scary, up with these huh? bizarre characters? And I just look at him at night and say, where'd that come from? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Crazy. So anyway, that's, that's, our, that's our talk. And now I guess Bill is going to uh, engage you with questions. So thank you for listening. Thanks, Sarah. Mm -hmm. the post okay, is thanks. Thank you uh, very much, uh, both of you. Uh, Richard, that was, uh, wow, that was powerful and, and sobering. And- thank you. Uh, well, I have to uh, read the read the other books now. Um, I wanted to uh, take the uh, moderator's privilege and ask yes. the first question. And um, I have not written a book myself, but what I understand is that writers, it's the understanding is that writers are supposed to write about what they know. Hmm. And um, and of course, your uh, your protagonist is a college philosophy professor. Yeah. So I get it. That makes sense. However, you go on about crime, boats, guns, gangs, mm -hmm. Chinese tong, mm -hmm. characters in the Everglades. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it just doesn't fit with the Richard I know. And um, yeah. uh, can you tell us uh, a bit more about how you went beyond a uh, college professor to uh, be so knowledgeable about all of those things? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Um, yeah, that's an awfully good question. And a lot of research does go into these books. I spend as much time doing research as I actually spend writing. Like I said, it took 10 years to write Cooper's Moon, um, mainly to get it right and toss away two or three editions of it. But uh, yes, how do I learn about guns and the Everglades and uh, gangs? I have personal experience talking with gang members. It's not something that you really want to do too much. Um, I, I tried to talk to a gang member in Tampa, <clears throat> uh, a teacher friend of mine who was in one of my classes when I was teaching in St. Leo said, a member of my student is a, is a gang member in Hillsborough County, and here's his phone number. So I called him as a young kid in high school, and I said, uh, well, you know, so-and-so mentions that and I didn't quite know how to to begin this conversation, said that you're in a gang. And he said, that's right. And I said, so I wanted to learn a little bit about gangs. He said, you only need to know one thing, Mr. Conrad, gangs are dangerous. So at that point, I, I had a funny feeling in my stomach that this conversation was not going in the direction I wanted it to go. And I asked him again, is there anything more? He said, there's just one thing you need to know that gangs are dangerous. As I did more research on gangs, you know, I, I learned about the, you know, about the, uh, the initiation right for being in a gang. For a man is to go kill somebody, just like that. The gang member says, go across the street and kill that person. An innocent person, 
So if you happen to stumble into a gang territory, you could be the victim. And, um, and I met some other gang members too, who shall remain anonymous, mostly because I don't want them to come after me. Um, and about, um, you know, about policemen and guns. Well, you know, I grew up with guns being on a farm, used them only in, in the proper way, hunting, and I never shot an animal in my life. I aimed like I could never hit them. I thought, oh no, I'm not doing this. I had a rabbit looking at me one time and I couldn't shoot it. I thought, go away. <laughs> so I, I, I learned how to use them because that's farm life, just for target practice. And I learned about them and took an interest in what guns are. And, um, and boats and the Everglades, well, I explored them. I, I went on trips with uh, some, some of the old folks. Uh, I'm talking about the old folks at, at, uh, at in Everglades City who are, have a long history of interacting with, how can I describe them as interesting characters? <laughs> and they're, you know, they're involved in smuggling and whatever. There's a lot of bodies in the Everglades. You really want to look for them. So I, I, I learned that way. I do have firsthand experience of the Everglades. Okay, um, we have a comment from, uh, from one of our uh, readers. Thanks, enjoyed the talk, have already downloaded book one on my Kindle. So that's good news. Wow. Okay. That's good news, good for her. Oh, thank you. And um, thank you, uh, <laughs> thank let's you. see, here, here's another question. It's related to what you, you, you did um, address this a little bit, but uh, mm -hmm. just to uh, make sure that I understand. Question is, um, uh, you did you did uh, address this. Do you know where you're going when you start? Outline question mark. Mm -hmm. Know the ending before you begin writing. You you said that you were a, originally a a pantser. I think yeah. if I understood you correctly, is right. that you are not now? You outline along the lines yeah. of Patterson, Patterson or somewhere in between? No, I'm not even in between Patterson. He just outlines everything. Oh my gosh, you know I write mysteries and I and I tell myself that. This is a mystery. You know, I know I want to learn about where this mystery is going as much as my reader does. And so I, I don't like to know the ending, though I have to have an idea of that ending. I learned. You don't want to get to the ending and I have to place a bunch of clues in there to uh, guide readers to the ending. But I, I really feel as though if I have a general sense of where the book is heading or where it's tending, as I did in Blood Moon Rising and in a cold copper moon for sure. Um, and I can't reveal that, Bill, because then we'd have to have everybody eliminated. Um, yeah. and <laughs> I hope people know that I'm kidding. You know, I, I don't want a whole bunch of lawsuits coming away. Just kidding. Um, spoiler. Um, well, you know, I, I, think, I think I need to have a general sense of, of where it's going to end, but I, I, like to, I like to get there. And, and I think I, I let the characters take me there. You know, they they're part of the story and they do talk to me at night. I mean, I meet them, I live with them all day. Gosh, and they bug me about this and that. And I think about Cooper and, and I think he, he sort of like talks to me like, you know, you think you're like me, but you're not. And I am, but I'm not. People do ask, you know, are we the main characters? We have to write about ourselves, Bill, because we can only write intelligently about what we know. And so our, we are coming out in our stories. That, that, that you're actually hit upon another question. Uh, and that is um, how much of the character is a part of your own personal experiences and personality. Obviously, we, uh, I mentioned earlier that you were a philosophy professor. But beyond yeah. that, do you, do you feel that that at least some of Cooper as he moves across mm -hmm. is you? Yes, I, yeah, he, he is me. I, a one how one. much is he like me? I, I don't know. Uh, I think he's a lot like him. I think Richard hides this side of I himself. Guess. That's a little fire, you know, I remember us driving down in Miami on our honeymoon and uh, so we were in sort of a gang area and some guy started yelling and trying to pull me out of the car. It was crazy. And 
he just rammed on the gas and people were standing in front. He didn't care. He was well, just, I, boom. No, you did. Well, I wasn't going to slaughter people. You were. I mean, it was like, he is there not dragging me up. He's got this other side that, oh. you know, a little rough and ready. I'll tell you one more story. We were in Boca. We lived in a house that was not in the gated community. And at three o'clock in the morning, some person is just pounding on our front door. So he's got his slippers on and a pair of shorts and a t-shirt. And he goes walking, shuffling over to the front door. And I said, don't you dare open that door. And he said, why? Somebody, somebody's here, what do they want? And I, so I grabbed my cat and my dog and I went over to the back door to run out because I thought he's crazy. And so he opens the door and there's these two gigantic guys and they go, where's the Maserati? And Richard goes, we don't own a Maserati. And he said, I'm coming to collect it. And Richard goes, look, you see this step right here? Don't you pass this step. I'm calling the police. Oh, wow. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> but that's this guy, okay? That's who he is, Mr. Gentleman and then Mr. Well, Bizarre. Well, thank you. I, I did grow up in a fac <laughs> near a factory and uh, I did have to fight my way home from school every day. So I, I learned how to fight because my dad was a boxer and he taught me to box. And, um, and so I, I did learn the hard way of having to fight. But um, I also, I also like the idea of, of how cops operate when you have family members who are cops or sister is a cop. And I've always enjoyed that. I don't know why. And so then I began taking uh, classes for my private investigator license. So I, I have finished most of that. I have just a short more time to go. I have my badge, Bill, but I can't wear it until I get my license. <laughs> but, but I, I do have, um, I have learned a lot of skills. I wanted to learn, you know, since my character is a private investigator, I mean, character Cooper, I wanted to learn what he goes through. And, uh, and so, so I do have that experience. And Am I answering that question? I forgot what I was yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah, you did. So you may not yet have the badge, but you have the hat. And the hat is very, <laughs> we like That's that. That's just branding. I we like branded this hat. that. We do, we do like the hat. Um, going back, you mentioned um, about uh, how much research you're doing. There's another question related to this um, about have you uh, writing about places you've lived in, like Ohio, which you did. Yeah. But but how do you how did you get the realism, for example, on the Everglades? Because I doubt you've ever lived in the Everglades. You know, it's not far from here. But no. how did you get that piece of it? Well, some of it's creative. I got I got to tell you, because <clears throat> I study the Everglades very carefully. But I have explored them with uh, Captain Futch, by the way, who Randy Wayne White uh, gave me as a as a, a reference. I asked Randy. How did you get your information about the Everglades? He says, talk to Captain Futch. He's down there in Everglades City. And Captain Futch is one of those old Florida guys who, you know, I mean, I, I don't know how to describe him. He's just old He's like Florida. Huckster Crow. He's kind He's of like, like Huckster, Huckster Crow. Crow. He's, they, they're a breed in themselves, like a cowboy. And I, you know, one of the original Florida cowboys uh, as, as, as is Huckster Crow. Mm -hmm. um, so he said, yeah, I'll take you out there in the Everglades. And Karen said, well, he did. We explored the Everglades with him. And I've been out there on my own. Um, and he said, uh, Karen says, I'd like to move down here. Because it's crazy and wild. Let's do it. And he said, <laughs> yeah. is, your, is your name uh, something like Conway? Smallwood. Smallwood. Brown. No, Brown. No. Well, you better not move here then. Because everybody <laughs> in has got that name. They don't trust outsiders. They have too many secrets. Sure. They don't want to be down there. And so I learned a lot about, about the Everglades, just going down to Everglades City, getting a fast boat, going around the Everglades, boating out there from Randy. And so it's a pretty accurate picture of, of how that wild, crazy place really is. It came across like that. I particularly liked your character, Huckster Crow. <laughs> That's a great character. He was. It was. It was well done. Yeah. I do have a question from your fellow college president, ah. Chuck Kubchella, and, and he said, "In uh -huh. your presentation, you apparently have given some thought to how the movie might be cast." 
Yes, yes. Clint, Clint Eastwood might be too old, by the way. How, soon, how soon the movie? Yeah. We want Bradley Cooper to play, yeah, Co I know. To play Karen, Cooper. Karen has all kinds of ideas. Uh, that's nice. Have you me. heard from anybody about a yeah. possible Wait, movie I mean, uh, three yet? Oh, Just Steven before King. this broadcast here, uh, Steven Spielberg did call me, <laughs> and I told him I was busy talking to the Pope. I could possibly <laughs> answer him. Um, what about Stephen Wait, King? we I sent as the marketing person, I took all the books and I put them in this red paper and sprinkles and ribbons and I put them in a box and sent them to Tabitha King. Mm. And I um, also sent them to Robert Parker's son because people say he writes like Robert Parker Spencer. Mm. And nobody answered, but I thought they might, you know. <laughs> it was a what do you have to lose? <laughs> I'm glad that you have have met um, Randy Wayne White because honestly, and I'm not just saying this because yeah, you're yeah. you're a friend, uh, but um, uh, I thought it was as good. I've read several Randy Wayne White, and I like him a lot. And honestly, I thought Cooper, Cold, Cold Copper Moon was as good as anything I've read of his. That's the truth. Thank um, you. Yeah. And uh, I have another one here, and it says, um, um, oh, wait, I lost it. Sorry. Um, oh, it, yeah, you address, uh, I'll, this is me now, you addressed um, about real episodes that you're aware of, like the terrible kidnapping of that child, and that's the kind of thing that could be um, backdrop for the way you write the kidnapping yes. of Maxis, but um, beyond that, beyond that, whether or not you know the uh, end, where you're going at the end, uh, how do you find the the thread and the plot? That's what this, how do you find your plots for your novels is the question. Yeah, I don't I don't necessarily develop it right away. It, I, it, I have the general idea, not like James Patterson who sits down and writes it out, you know, very assiduously, uh, part by part, and then he gives it to somebody else to write it. He doesn't write the book. He's a machine. <laughs> um, but for me, I, I have a general idea. And for, uh, for, for really for all, all of my books, uh, the plot develops as I develop the characters. And I think, okay, that character's not going to go there. Huckster's not going to do that. Richie's not going to get involved in that. Or DeFelice isn't. Or Louise, you know, the, the gangland uh, homicide detective is not going to. That's not where this should go. It doesn't feel right. And so they kind of redirect me. It's kind of like my characters talk to me and say, this is where it should go. Or I get up in the morning and I thought, oh my gosh. Um, I'm not gonna tell you how I developed the plot for the third book because it comes at the end. And uh, for me to say anything about it is- um, Understood. The slip my wrist. No spoilers, <laughs> no spoilers. No spoiler alert. So yeah. they, they developed that way, Bill. Understood. Richard, and also your excellent helper and, uh, and soulmate there, Karen, thank you both very much for, you for your time and for your expertise, especially for those of us who've always dreamed of writing a book and, of course, probably never will do it. Um, oh, yeah. it's, really, it's really an inspiration. Um, thank you very much. It was a fascinating discussion. And uh, now I'm glad to know that we have another uh, great Florida writer. That's a, that's a good thing. Um, best Thank of luck you. on writing the next book, Thank The uh, Blood Merchants. And uh, please come back when you can to tell us um, how you, about your experiences in writing in both in Turkey that inspired this, as well as how you put together this next book that you're, you're working on. And meanwhile, yeah. thanks to everyone who joined us today for your questions and comments. Uh, we hope that you and all of our CCT friends will take a look at the wide range of informative presentations already on the Center for Critical Thinking's YouTube site channel. And uh, please also keep your eyes open for the many new videos and webinars that are coming your way. So on behalf of the CCT, I welcome you and uh, uh, again, and thank you for attending. And I urge you all to get vaccinated and stay well. Bill, <laughs> you are the best facilitator. He's done a number of these talks and you are superb. Thank, yes. you. thank you. 
Thank well, you. I'm a, I'm a Richard fan. Thank you. <laughs> so Thank, much. You. Oh, my. Thank you. Stay well. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.